this time, Dave Kendall comes to read our scripture passage. You all are getting older, you know that? <laughs> Not me. Uh. This is going to sound a little bit familiar, this Psalm 86, and if it does sound familiar, you can look at the first verses in Psalm 5, which are almost the same, the same sentiment. Psalm 86, incline thine ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am afflicted and needy. Do preserve my soul, for I am a godly man. O oh, thou, my God, save thy servant who trusts in thee. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to thee I cry out all day long. Make glad the soul of thy servant, for to thee, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon thee. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer, and give heed to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble I shall call upon thee, for thou will answer me. There is no one like thee among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like thine. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and they shall glorify thy name, for thou art great and doest wondrous deeds. Thou alone art God. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will give thanks to thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and will glorify thy name forever. For thy loving kindness toward me is great, and thou hast delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Dave. Good morning. Um, as Pastor Kyle mentioned earlier, we do have a candidate for executive pastor, formerly the business administrator position, and he's actually here this morning. So I'm going to invite Brett. Would you bring Jackson up here just for people to see you? I'm not going to make you say anything. Uh, in fact, I... He's for a candidate for pastor, so if I give him the mic, I may not get it back. Um, but I'm going to have him come up here just so you can see him and welcome him. Uh, wife Molly, you can come up here. That's okay if you're, uh, if you're okay, Jackson, doing that. Thank you. Uh, Molly is away, I believe, in Costa Rica at the passing of her father. So um, we're going to be praying for, uh, for them and for Molly. But I wanted you to see them. Uh, they've gone through the, uh, the battery of different interviews and tests and things. And so uh, we do want you to have an opportunity to interact with Brett and Jackson and Molly. And uh, as we have opportunity, they're going to be in various meetings that you'll hear about. The most important one being the Q&A, that uh, the information is in your bulletin on the back side of that flyer. But he'll also be here after the service in the foyer, uh, available to take questions and things like that. But I'd like to pray for, for them and for us as we go through this process. And so would you join me as we pray for them? Father, first of all, thank you that you have brought Brett here and Molly and Jackson. And thank you, Lord, that you have um, called them to serve you. And Lord, so as we go through this process of trying to see, is this the place that you want him to serve? That you want their family to plant? Do you want to bless them and make them a blessing? We ask for wisdom. We ask for guidance. We ask for your strength. And Lord, I pray that you would guide them to know what your will is for them and guide Damascus Community Church to be able to ask the right questions and, and pray the right prayer so that we would know if this is the direction you're calling us to. Again, we thank you for how you gift your people, and we pray, Lord, that if this is your will for us, that we would dedicate ourselves, our hearts, our lives to you, Brett and his family's lives to you, for the sake of your purposes here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. They didn't know I was going to call them up, so thanks for being flexible there. That's right. Well, I want you to imagine that you were born with no arms or legs. Do 
Do you think you could ever be happy? Do you think you could ever be thankful? You may not know the name Nick Vujicic, but if you ever saw him, you would remember him. Because Nick is a Christian evangelist and motivational speaker who has shared his story with millions worldwide because he was born without arms or legs. Does that picture get up there? Yeah. He's been famously quoted as having said this. Often people ask how I manage to be happy despite having no arms and no legs. The quick answer is that I have a choice. I can be angry about not having limbs, or I can be thankful that I have a purpose. I chose gratitude. And specifically, he chose to be grateful to Jesus for infusing his life with purpose after reading John chapter 9 about how the fact that the blind man had been given a purpose that he might declare the works of God in his life, and it changed his life. So we're 11 days from celebrating Thanksgiving, and I don't know everything that you've gone through in your life, I don't know the pains that you're enduring, how hard it might be to be thankful at times, but Nick Vujicic, the guy with no arms or legs, has chosen to be thankful because he says, being thankful has made me happy. Which is actually not just the testimony of a Christian motivational speaker. It's actually the testimony of science. I'll give you an example. A recent study from the Harvard Medical School was reported. This was reported in their newsletter in in an article entitled, Giving Thanks Can Make You Happier. The article acknowledges that November can be a horribly stressful month, right? It's the beginning of holiday season. There are certain expectations. There's shopping. There's being with family, which for some people is stressful. But the article notes, quote, research and common sense suggest that one aspect of the Thanksgiving season can actually lift the spirits. And it's built right into the holiday. Expressing gratitude. Go figure. On Thanksgiving. And the conclusion of the research is that giving thanks actually does make you happier. And because of that, this article includes different ways to cultivate gratitude. And here's the list. Number one, write a thank you note. Number two, thank someone mentally. I think you should probably just thank them personally. (laughs) Number three, keep a gratitude journal. Number four, count your blessings. And then number five, pray. And it says people who are religious can use prayer to cultivate gratitude. So I want you to think about what this article from Harvard Medical School is saying. It is saying if you want to be happy, then you need to be thankful. And one way to cultivate that thankfulness is to pray. Now you and I both know that not everyone prays to Jesus. Not everyone prays to Yahweh because some people don't know Jesus and they can't access God the Father. And so for them, prayer might give them a feeling of gratitude, but it's really a monologue to the ceiling because there's no recipient of their thanksgiving if they're not praying to Yahweh. But how is that different for a follower of Jesus Christ who does pray to the true and living God of the Bible? What is the connection between being thankful and having a life of prayer. And how does that, that life of prayer cultivate a thankfulness in you that can bring a man born with no arms or legs to be happy? How does prayer foster a thankfulness that can bring you hope and joy when you're in the middle of the pit? You're not on the upside. You're right in the pit of the sorrow in the middle of a crisis. For the one who knows God as Father and who serves Jesus as Lord, thankfully there is an answer, and it's in Psalm 86. And so let's pray as we go to the scriptures. Father, thank you for your word, and we thank you. We praise you and we thank you that you are a great and mighty God. We thank you that we can come here today as people whose sin has been washed by the blood of Christ, who have been cleansed from that sin and who now have access to you, Father, in conversation 
with, with our Heavenly Father, the one who has inclined your ear to hear us. And so we ask now that your Holy Spirit would teach us this morning as we go to your word and foster in us a thankfulness, overwhelm us with a sense of thankfulness for what you've done for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you've closed your Bibles, why don't you open those up to Psalm 86. Take out your sermon notes if you're going to use those. For the next few weeks, we're going to be in the Psalms. We're going to be going through a couple different Psalms surrounding Thanksgiving and this topic of Thanksgiving as, as the psalmist call on the name of the Lord and then embedded in that call are Thanksgiving prayers. And the first one that we're going to be at is this one, Psalm 86. And if you look at verse 1, you'll see that the very first words are a prayer of David. And so this is a prayerful psalm. And it's a prayerful song of lament or sorrow or grief. And so if you've ever gone through something painful, maybe it may be a grief that just had you broken and you found yourself in tears or on your knees or just in mental exhaustion and you cried out to God, help me, save me, I'm in this situation, I can't get out. If you were to write down that prayer, that's what this psalm is in the life of David. Something has happened. And David is in a deep sorrow and a grief. And while we don't know exactly what it is that prompted, us, that prompted him to write this, there are some clues in the text that help us out. And so in verse 1, you'll notice he says that he's poor and needy. So something's going on where he's feeling like he's in need. Verse 2, he asks God to preserve his life. And so something's threatening, threatening his, his very life. Verses 3 and 5 and 15 and 16, he appeals to God for mercy and grace and forgiveness. So, so probably sin is involved somewhere in this because he's asking for forgiveness. Verse 14, he says that insolent or arrogant men have risen up against him. A band of ruthless men who don't know God, they seek his life. He's being chased by these people who are trying to destroy him. And then verse 17, he says that those people hate him. So you can see there's sort of this, this picture that's painted of the situation he's in. There are some ungodly thugs who are trying to kill David, and David is beginning to feel a little vulnerable, maybe because they're getting real close. And ironically, David's own sins may have contributed to what he's going through because he's not just asking for rescue. He's asking for grace and mercy and forgiveness. You ever been there? You created a, a situation, you, you messed something up, and so you're asking God for not only a rescue from the situation, but forgiveness and, and, and a rescue from the mess that you've made that you can't fix. If you've ever been there, then you sort of know where David's coming from. Well, David makes 14 different requests for God's help in this prayer. Some examples, verse 1, incline your ear, he asks of God. Verse 2, preserve my life. Verse 4, glad in my soul. Verse 11, teach me your way. But after making nine of those 14 requests, you'll notice that in verse 12, he stops and he breaks out in this proclamation of thanks. He says, I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. So right in the middle of this, this lament, this grief and sorrow, he breaks out in this prayer of thanks and a commitment to continue to give thanks to God. How can he do that? How can he be thankful for anything when he has these arrogant men who are chasing after, ruthless men who are coming after him to kill him? I mean, he is not in a time of rest or peace or comfort. In fact, in verse 7, he says he's struggling through a day of trouble. You ever had a day of trouble? You know, where you, giving thanks is the last thing on your mind. And it's so hard to come up with anything that you can be thankful to God for because you believe that he's allowed this pain and this grief into your life. What gives you the power and the ability to be thankful? What gives David the ability to be thankful in the midst of that. It's because he has a relationship with God. And it's a relationship based on a covenant. It's based on a promise that God has made to those who are his. Notice how he begins. Verse 1. 
he starts his prayer by saying, Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me. The word there for Lord, you'll notice, is in all caps. And as we said weeks ago, that indicates that the Hebrew word behind that is the personal name of God, Yahweh. So we're talking about Yahweh. He's clearly requesting the attention of Yahweh God and no other God. And so that's how he starts his prayer. But you'll also notice in his thanksgiving in verse 12, you'll notice that he addresses God differently. He says, I give thanks to you, O Lord, not caps, my God. The word there for Lord that's not in caps is, is the Hebrew word Adonai, which means master or Lord. And so David is identifying Yahweh as his master. He has a relationship with his master. Baal is not his master. Marduk is not his master. Dagon is not his master. Yahweh is his Adonai, his Lord and his master. And therefore, David is his servant. That's his relationship, and he knows he has it in this covenant relationship with God. And in verse 2, he makes it very clear. He says, preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. And what kind of God is his God? Verse 5, he says, his God abounds with steadfast love to those who call upon his name. Now, David did not make up that description of God. David clearly knows Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love for those who love him and keep his commandments for how long? For a thousand generations. That's the covenant that God made to anyone who would love him and obey him. And so you can see that David has confidence in the midst of his grief, in the midst of his pleas for help. He has a confidence because he knows that he has a God that who, who will not only listen to him, but will show him mercy and grace and steadfast love and forgiveness because that's what he has promised to his servants. You can hear that confidence in David's prayer. Verse 1, incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I'm poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I'm godly, seeking to be obedient. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Verse 5, for you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Verse 6, give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you. Why? For you answer me. You answer me. He is confident that God will answer him. And he knows who he's talking to because he knows who this God is. And he knows he will listen and he will answer because God is a God who keeps his promises. Now, does he know how he will answer? No. He doesn't know how he's going to answer, but, verse 4, he lifts up his soul to God because he knows that God has the power to save him and because he knows God has David's best in mind. And out of that confidence, it bursts forth thanksgiving. Verse 12, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, my God. Here's the first lesson for us to learn from all that. Point number one this morning, your prayer of thanks flows from your covenant relationship with God. Flows from that relationship, and it's a relationship of covenant, of promise. Just think about this. Jesus promised in John 14, 6, that he would be the way, that he is the way to a relationship with God the Father. And that through him, and only him, if you're a follower of Christ then you always have something to be thankful for, regardless of the circumstances. Yes, your thanksgiving will abound when things are going well. And thanksgiving may be hard when you're going through crisis. You're born without arms or legs. You're faced with a broken relationship. You have a doctor who says that there's nothing else that they can do. 
You're feeling one blow after another in a relentless barrage of disappointment. It is easy and it is natural and understandable to have lots of things that would challenge the ability to give thanks. And we've all experienced those things, haven't we? But your reason for thanksgiving to God is not dependent on those circumstances. Your reason for thanksgiving to God is not dependent on those circumstances because those circumstances don't change the fact that Jesus died to pay the penalty for your sin and rose to offer you a life eternal with him. And if you have committed your life to serve him and to obey Yahweh as God and you have Jesus as your Adonai, Jesus as your Lord and Master, then God has promised He has promised not only to hear your prayers, but to show you steadfast love as a heavenly father. And so you always have something to be thankful for. You always have content to offer in thanksgiving and prayer to God. Because your thanksgiving prayer does not flow from your circumstances. It flows from the fact that you have a relationship with the God of the universe who has promised to show you his steadfast love if you or a follower and servant of him. Which means, no matter what you're going through, he's right there with you. And like a father, he, he inclines his, decli- his divine ear to listen to you, to hear you in the midst of your pleas and your grief. And whether he rescues you from the pain now or he doesn't do it until you die and you're with him, regardless, you have a reason for thanksgiving. Because he has promised to be with you now and to be with you in eternity. That should compel you to give thanks in prayer, no matter what's going on, as hard as it is. That's what he's done for us. Now, that can still be hard to do, right? Because when Life gets tough, it's easy to begin complaining and even to begin to blame God for the circumstances rather than thanking God for his mercy and his grace. And we begin thinking, well, since God isn't fixing this, I'll just take care of it myself. And we medicate our pain with sin rather than prayer. And slowly, we begin to give our hearts something else. And and our hearts become divided as they're filled with other things. And and smaller parts of our heart is given and dedicated to our schedule and our attention given, given to God. As other things begin to creep in and take hold of our attention and hold of our heart and make distractions for our thankfulness and our life in God. So the question is then how do we maintain a life of prayerful thanksgiving? How do we Make sure that our hearts are wholeheartedly his when we are faced with things that threaten to push him out of our hearts. Well, David seemed to know what to do. And you'll notice in verse 12, he says, I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart. His prayer is a commitment to give thanks with his whole heart. Heart, But what does he know is necessary if he's going to maintain that situation, that that committed wholeheartedness to Christ? What does he know he's going to have to have? Well, look just prior to the Thanksgiving. What does he say? Verse 11, David prays, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. (laughs) You see, David recognizes something that you and I both know. When you get into a crisis, it is going to be very hard for you to maintain your heart for God. You see, David is in the situation where he knows he doesn't have strength to make it through the current crisis. He he has ruthless men chasing him. But David also knows that his heart is under attack. And that Satan is going to go for his heart. Satan's going to want to try to push God out of who he is and out of the commitment that he has. As sorrow and grief can often produce desperation and panic, we begin to reach for other things instead of God. And like a person who's drowning, searches or reaches for, for anything that they can find to put their head above water, we oftentimes in that despair, we reach for things, even sin, to try to just make the pain go away. 
David must know that temptation because there's a request for prayer in verse 11 is teach me your way O Lord that I may walk in your truth unite my heart to fear your name teach me your way that I might fear your name why why would fearing God's name with a whole why would that help him with having a whole heart what part does fearing God's name have a united heart to fear God's name. What part does that have to play in this whole situation? I think it means that it's a request that he would be convinced of what, how God views him in his sin in his life. I think it means that he wants to be convinced wholeheartedly that God is holy and perfect and in my sin I deserve only wrath and pain and grief and sorrow and I'm not entitled to anything from him. I think that's what David's praying. Now, why? Why would David ask to have a heart that is united behind that depressing truth? Here's why. Because when you realize that that is what you deserve, then and only then can you truly be thankful for the mercy of God. It shows you steadfast love. Not because you deserve it, but because he's gracious. See, understanding the depth of that love and grace that has been shown to you will overwhelm you with thanksgiving. When you recognize the the amount of grace that God has showered upon you, even to give you a breath, so that you're alive today, when you recognize that that is a gift of God's grace, it will overwhelm you with thanksgiving if you get it. But Satan's goal for your life is that you don't get it. Satan wants you to believe that you are entitled to more. And when you don't get what you think you're entitled to, entitled to, to tempt you to begin to question God's goodness, to begin to question God's truth, and to believe that God is somehow holding back blessings that you deserve. That's his tactic. And it's in every commercial you see on TV. And he's been telling that lie since the very beginning. That was the lie to Eve. In the paradise of the Garden of Eden, his lie was, God isn't giving you everything that you're entitled to. God isn't giving you what you deserve. And Satan continues to foster that lie even today with challenges to God's character. If God is good, then why is there evil? If God is powerful, then why is there sickness? If God is love, then why is there violence? And the simple true answer to those questions is, God is good, and God is powerful, and God is loving. And the reason that sickness and violence and evil exist is because we are not good, and we are not powerful, and we are not ultimately loving. And in our sin, we're getting exactly what we deserve. Satan's going to try to tell you otherwise. And so if you're going to be successful in not believing his lies, then your prayer must be David's prayer. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Well, how will God teach you his way? It's going to happen through you disciplining yourself to read his word. To get into the scriptures. That is the antidote to Satan's lies. That is the only way to maintain a united heart that can honestly say, regardless of the circumstances, and even through tears, I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart. So here's the lesson for us in that. Point number two, your prayer of thanks is a disciplined result of an undivided heart. The discipline result. Because giving thanks with a whole heart is is not the natural response of a fallen sinner, isn't it? It's not our our default to be thankful. Complaining is our default, isn't it? Or just mine? Complaining is our default response, and in a, a broken world, we have to be retrained to be thankful. 
And the only way to do that is to reprogram our minds with God's word. And when we begin to do that, you know what happens? We begin to see the world through God's perspective. And we begin to see just how gracious and patient and kind and how much steadfast love God shows us each and every day when we don't deserve it. And as we become more aware of how undeserving we are, there's an interesting thing that happens. We become more aware of how deserving God is of our thanks and our praise and our worship. And you'll notice that's where David goes next, verse 12. He makes a commitment. After giving thanks, he says, I will glorify your name forever. I give thanks to you, and I will glorify your name forever. Can you imagine that? The situation that David's in, he's being hunted by men trying to kill him, and he still gives God thanks, and he still commits his life to glorify God forever, which would imply that he's committing to praise God regardless of how God answers his prayer. Because it's not dependent on that. God has already shown himself to deserve it. And David recounts why. Just listen to the praises that David offers in verses 8 through 10. He says, There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name, for you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. See, David recognizes that the greatness of God is not dependent on how he answers David's prayer. It's not dependent on whether or not God rescues him or not. God is great, period. And he's the only one who is great. It's not dependent on his circumstances. And there is no other God like David's God. And no other God can do what his God can do. And David says in verse 9 that he alone deserves the praise and the thanksgiving. Not just from David, not just from Israel, but from all the nations of the world, which, guess what, includes you and me. Because we're part of that. And not just when things are going well. He deserves our thanksgiving not just in the days of joy and comfort and peace, but in the days of trouble. Because he deserves it. Because he's worthy of it. Because he alone is great. So here's the final lesson for us this morning. Point number three. Your prayer of thanks comes as a worshipful response to the exclusive greatness of God. Exclusive. Only his, the exclusive greatness of God. See, that's what David's prayer is in Psalm 86. It's a, it's a prayer of lament, but it's a worshipful response, a thankful response, a worshipful response to, to what God has done and to the greatness of God above all the other gods. But that was back in Bible times. What would that kind of response be if it was given today? I want to give you an example, not necessarily because it's the best example of a prayer of thanks that comes as a worshipful response to the greatness of God, but because it's probably the one that's received the most attention in the last several weeks. One of the most reported news stories the last couple months has been the apparent repentance and conversion of Kanye West to Christ. Now, if you don't know who Kanye West is, uh, he's a hip-hop artist who has been known, or has been called the most influential artist of his generation, of my generation. And in fact, because of that, he's uh, made a huge impact on the culture. Whether you know it or not, you are experiencing it. He has changed the culture. And articles abound as to whether or not his newfound faith is real. And I would just advise all of us to be careful about questioning the heart of a person. And we should leave that to the Lord to judge his heart. And I think we should commit to pray. Because what happens with Kanye West is not the end of the world either way, but it does have an influence on our culture. And so we should pray for his heart. But I want you to hear what he recently said in a worship service in Atlanta, because regardless of his motives and regardless of what happens in his life, what he says about God is true. Here are his words. I've seen him, that's God, work miracles in my life. 
You know, the devil presents so many flashy, shiny objects. I've seen everything the devil could show you by TV, videos, car dealerships, jewelry, houses. And I'll tell you, nothing beats God. I know we all say this is the culture, that's the culture. To be radically in service to Christ is the only culture that I want to know about. In other words, I want to be wholeheartedly committed to Christ because only Christ is exclusively great. But then listen what he did next. In the middle of this testimony, Kanye West does what David did. And he breaks his prayer, or he breaks his, his speech to pray a prayer of thanks. And this is what he says. Thank you for saving me, for replenishing me, for delivering me. When I find out, found out about you and got closer to you, I got closer to my children, got closer to my family. Because the devil had me chasing a gold statue, had me chasing cars, had me chasing numbers. And then he concluded, the power of God cannot be calculated by a number, by a first week sale, by a bank account, by how many cars you drive, by how big your house is, and how many acres you got. It's God inside of us. Now I want you to think about this. Kanye West, the man who could have anything he wants, he's got enough money, he could buy any type of hope or joy that this world has to offer him, testified to the exclusive greatness of God and said, nothing beats God. And then in response, broke out in a prayer of thanks to God. Why? Because when it hits you just how great God alone is, when it finally settles in your mind through the power of the Spirit, that while the world may promise you lots of things to give you peace or happiness in this life, only Yahweh sent Jesus. And only Jesus made a promise for eternal life, and only Jesus can make that promise and keep that promise. And when it finally hits you that only Jesus can save not just your body, but your soul forever, a prayer of thanks comes as a natural worshipful response to the exclusive greatness of God. So here's the question as we close this morning. How's your thankfulness? How's your thanksgiving? I don't mean the date that's coming in a couple weeks. I mean, how are your prayers of thanksgiving to God? Are you a thankful person, or is it hard for you to remember to give thanks to God for anything? We challenge you with a couple questions. First question is obvious. You need to ask, do you have a covenant relationship with God? That, that's the first place to start. That, that's where thankfulness flows. If you don't have a relationship with God, you're not going to be thankful to God because you're not going to recognize what he has done to make that relationship possible. So do you know Jesus? Do you have a relationship with God as Father? But then, are you cultivating that relationship? If you do have a relationship with God, then are you cultivating it by speaking with him and listening to him through his word? Are you cultivating the relationship so that you value it, where you understand what he's done for you? If you're not, you can't expect to be thankful to God because that flows from understanding what he's done for you and what he offers you in that relationship. So then you have to ask yourself, do you have an undivided heart? Do you have an undivided heart that fears the name of God? See, a prayerful response, a worshipful response of thanksgiving comes from a heart that is not divided between a love for the world and a love for God. It's seeking completely and pursuing that relationship wholeheartedly for Christ. Now, we're in process. And it doesn't happen overnight. And we've talked about that before. But are you pursuing? Are you pursuing a wholehearted relationship with Jesus? Or are there some things that you're chasing to try to make you happy? You have a wholehearted desire to follow after Christ. And you, you recognize that he's the only one who can offer you joy and happiness. 
then the response to that will be, you will recognize that he is exclusively great, and it will prompt thanks in your heart. It will bring thanks to your prayers, because you understand who he is. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you. Just the ability to call you Father is a, is a gift. The greatness of who you are and that you have revealed yourself to us so that we can know you. And you've sent Jesus so that through belief in him, and trust and putting, recognizing that Jesus, you are our Adonai, you are our master. We have relationship, we have a future, we have a hope. We thank you for that. And God, we would confess that we are not as thankful as we should be. There is a lot of entitlement that creeps up in how we view ourselves and how we view our culture. Lord, some of it is part of the culture, but help us to be able to agree that we want the only culture to be a radical commitment to Jesus Christ. That our desire for Jesus would be our sole devotion in our lives because we are truly thankful, Jesus, for what you've done for us. And as we get to know you more and we begin to see even more of your greatness, Holy Spirit, prompt in us a worshipful response of prayers and songs and words of thanksgiving. Not just on one day a year, but every single day. Create in us a grateful people because we know, Lord, that when our hearts are wholeheartedly committed to you, we will see you for who you are, and you deserve our thanks. And so we praise you in Jesus' name.